Welcome back after the break, everybody. Uh, we will be starting the last part of our program for today, which is the panel discussion on the main topic of the whole event, which is digital technologies and experiments in Holocaust education and awareness raising. Uh, so the topic is defined a bit broader than the, the, the topic of the whole event, because we want to look at different ideas for using digital technologies or experimental practices. Uh, in raising awareness about the Holocaust or educating about the Holocaust. And uh, our guests this evening are uh, Peter Dral, who represents Stories That Move. Hi, Peter, it's nice to have you here. Good evening, thank you for your invitation. Uh, Karolina Jara, uh, who represents the project New Synagogue in Breslau, a digital reconstruction. Hi, Karolina, it's nice to have you here. Hi, thank you for the invitation. And Alex Roth, who represents uh, the festival and the festivalters, which is a collective organized around the festival. It's good to have you, Alex. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so you all represent different projects or initiatives or institutions that are uh, experimenting with various ways of making use of technologies, digital technologies mostly, uh, in Holocaust education or in raising awareness about the Jewish history, Jewish past and the Holocaust. So my first question to you all, because our audience members might not know too much about the project uh, or institutions uh, or initiatives that you represent. So my first, first question to you all would be, uh, um, and I would like to ask you to introduce yourselves and the projects that you, you will be talking about. And uh, I would like to start with, uh, with Peter. So could you please tell us a little bit more about what Stories That Move is? Thank you. Um, this is not supposed to be a um, presentation um, with PowerPoint, but panel discussion. Uh, so I will not take too much time. Um, I will only share the screen um, in a few seconds uh, so that I show you what is, the, uh, what is Stories That Move about. Um, it is a project which is actually using um, authentic stories of uh, predominantly uh, contemporary young people uh, who have different identi identities, um, uh, experiences with uh, prejudice, stereotyping, uh, discrimination, which are complemented with uh, stories from the past. Um, I will now just like give you a glimpse of uh, how it looks like this is the front page um, where you can see that uh, many of the things which were mentioned already in the keynote speech, which was wonderful, and but also like the, the things which were mentioned uh, with the projects in the previous session, like about challenges and the opportunities, etc., are very um, common also like to our work. Uh, so this is, the, yeah, we already got some rewards. Um, this is the front page and the stories, which are like the integral part, and the core um, of, the, of the whole uh, learning tool and the website. Um, and you can see uh, that four out of five are young people from today. Uh, in the middle, there is a, what we call life story. Uh, so it's people like who were either persecuted or uh, survivors uh, or helpers um, or from any other period of history in uh, many different countries. Uh, we have also stories like this integrated in the tool. Um, and um, when we talk about stories, we basically talk about very short videos where young people um, share their experience, uh, talk about their identity, uh, discrimination, uh, that they either experience, witnessed, um, or they know about because of their peers, friends, uh, family members. Uh, this is the glimpse on the life stories, meet geese, uh, people um, who are um, familiar with Holocaust education uh, may very well know her, the helper of Anne Frank um, family. 
uh, Stefan Kosinski. Uh, I just want to point out uh, to uh, this guy because it, he is Polish, was Polish. Um, and his story is also remarkable about the gay guy who got in love with a um, Nazi soldier. Um, so these things are freely available. Uh, so any educator, either informal or informal education can use them. Uh, but if you want to be more ambitious as educator, um, then um, you can register for free again. And uh, you can use some of the, what we call learning paths, uh, something that is uh, um, already like, there is some pedagogical approach behind that. I can talk about it later if anybody is interested. Um, and actually you can, you can create your virtual class and you can do digital learning, uh, which is very collaborative as was mentioned by Victoria in the keynote speech. Um, it's not just a transfer of some of some uh, facts uh, and knowledge. It's about developing learning uh, in interaction with your peers in the classroom. And this is just so that I do not forget because it's tomorrow. Uh, Stefan Kosinski's uh, story was uh, was uh, made into a um, book by uh, Lutz van Dijk, um, and he's gonna have the event just tomorrow. So that you know, um, I will post it later in the chat, um, and he will he will be talking about the the whole uh, story of how he caught the guy and uh, caught his story, uh, so that we can learn from it. Um, what I want to say is just like basic things. Uh, we developed the tool. Um, from offline materials, teaching materials, which were developed by the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, uh, and then adapted into several countries. I don't know the number exactly, but it was definitely over uh, 10. And they were focusing on anti-Semitism, but they like one of the teaching materials already had um, uh, content, which was country specific, and it was tackling different isms. It wasn't only about anti-Semitism or only about the Holocaust. Um, but we wanted like to make it more relevant uh, to the country audience uh, of learners. Uh, and sometimes it wasn't definitely because of uh, the pandemic, but it was as soon as in 2012 or 13, we decided to go online because there was so online hate speech uh, and other um, manifestations of hatred. Uh, that we just wanted to provide a tool to teachers um, or anybody in non-formal education so that uh, they can tackle those issues online with digital tools and with the visuals and stories which are might be attractive for, uh, for young people nowadays. And um, the approach that we took like from the very beginning was we will not do the content. I mean, we, we as educators, researchers, uh, professionals, we will not just transmit something, but first we will ask young people that live nowadays in our societies, how they experience their identity, uh, stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination, and these kind of issues. So that's why we did this participatory uh, meetings uh, where we collected the stories and th those are the core through which they can actually learn about the historical issues of discrimination, including the Holocaust. Uh, but first we start like what is happening now. And then we go like to uh, the kind of exploration of how this is not something new, but those things were in different ways happening in the past to many people. Um, I think this is where I will stop and I'm happy like to answer other uh, questions about uh, challenges when going digital. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Peter, for this introduction. And and now I will move to Carolina. And before I do that, I we will you will soon learn that we have like three very different projects and very different approaches and in, in this panel discussion, which I think is great. And Stories That Moves is, I think, like the only one of the three projects that's like straightforward educational project. So we will see some challenges, re challenges related to that and different projects in what Carolina will be talking about and Alex will be talking about, which are 
like a bit different or like uh, projects that have a bit different mission. So Carolina, would you like to introduce us to, to your project? So the reconstruction of the new synagogue in Breslau. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, so my project um, is, uh, maybe I would start from the beginning. I'm art historian and architecture historian. And some time ago, like seven, eight years ago, I started uh, my uh, master thesis on the new synagogue in Wrocław. Um, and um, yeah, it was um, it was for me a very uh, interesting and and uh, touching story about the building. It was the second biggest uh, synagogue built in the uh, mid of nineteenth century after the uh, synagogue in Berlin. So it was a very uh, significant object for not only for Wrocław, that time German Breslau, but also. Uh, for uh, the whole um, German um, Germany and and uh, other uh, countries, uh, it, it is it, it was uh, uh, an object uh, that disappeared in, in 1938 uh, and during uh, the Nazi regime when all um, not all but many many synagogues and uh, Jewish um, uh, objects were um, destroyed. Uh, so um, the story of, of the Polish city, which started after the Second World War, um, begins without this building. So th there was a gap uh, in, the, in the city uh, and uh, the Polish society for many years was not conscious what, uh, where was the synagogue, that the synagogue was was uh, existing in, in the city and that was such a significant one. Maybe I can show you, um, I, I will show my screen and show you uh, just to, um, just to give you some, um, oh yes. So this is, this is the film. Uh, I don't know if uh, it will be possible to see it all. So maybe I will just skip. Can you see it? Um, yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, so um, this this is part of the project to to, to reconstruct this building, and you can see uh, the synagogue uh, and the uh, surrounding. Um, and I will maybe show you also the site uh, so you can see it later on. Mm, how to do this? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the main uh, idea of, uh, of the project of a digital reconstruction was to uh, create uh, the building in the digital form, uh, because uh, this uh, synagogue uh, probably will be never rebuilt, uh, although I'm not saying no, because uh, some uh, stories uh, of rebuilding the synagogues after many, many years uh, from zero to, to the whole building happens. But um, the situation in Breslau right now seems to be so that there is uh, no uh, possibility, no money, no need to, to reconstruct this building. Uh, so um, together uh, in a Polish-German cooperation, uh, the, 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 that was the idea to, to reconstruct this building um, as a digital uh, form. And um, of course, uh, there was many uh, question if we are able to do this because uh, the building itself uh, was built in the mid of the 19th centuries. Uh, and uh, of course, the, we, we have some limitations. Uh, what about the sources? Uh, and of course the question uh, why we want to do this and for uh, who we want to um, create this reconstruction, but I think we can just uh, talk about it later on in the discussion. Uh, but the project itself uh, was uh, meant to uh, take like two years and uh, it was international project with Polish, German, uh, also Russian um, students and, and uh, 
and group of, of people that were uh, building together uh, this special uh, website. It's a kind of database for direct construction. So you can also um, see um, how we did it in every step. And you can also see the sources we used to, to reconstruct the building. Mm, and we were trying to be very precise uh, what we know about uh, this building, what we don't know when we use some analogies. So, uh, of course, the uh, end um, effect, it's just this uh, reconstruction and the film, but there is also this, uh, let's say, backstage when you can just explore uh, the, the history of the synagogue and um, many um, extra information. So, yeah, so I will stop. I don't want to uh, talk too long about it. I know I could <laughs> because it's, it's very, um, very, very uh, huge database and many interesting information are included, but maybe we can just uh, come to this. And I, I will also put the, a link to the website on the chat. So after the discussion, you can still um search for extra information so thank you i already did that <laughs> thank you uh, thanks a lot and we will definitely come back to some of these issues uh, and now i will hand it over to alex uh, who is here in a double role because he not only he not only represents the festival and the festivalters but he's also an artist a musician who was involved in some of the projects that we will be talking about today so Alex, could you give us a brief introduction into the festival and the project? Sure, and uh, thanks for mentioning um, this uh, range of backgrounds that we're coming from, because as you hinted at, Ola, I, I don't primarily think of myself as an educator, although I have worked in education in various forms, but, but more as an artist. My background is primarily as a musician and I like to use music as a as an excuse almost to explore different disciplines, whether there are other artistic disciplines like theatre, film, poetry, etc. Or um, extra musical fields like uh, philosophy, social activism, environmentalism. And it's it's more in more or less in that capacity that I got involved with festival when I moved to Krakow about three years ago uh, because festival is a it's an arts and activism initiative uh, and an organization uh, which has been going for about four years now um, I wasn't involved in setting it up but as I said I, I got involved with it uh, when I came to Krakow and initially it was through collaborating on specific projects and uh, they range from alternative tours of Jewish Krakow uh, which were created as a kind of uh, almost to offset the traditional narrative that that people are exposed to if they're tourists in Krakow and they go on a tour of Kazimierz which is the, the Jewish quarter here there's a particular quite narrow focus um, which doesn't really go into much depth and so the idea of these tours was to literally create an alternative that um, could approach it from a different perspective uh, from a Jewish perspective which is something that's missing in in some of the tours and uh, initially my involvement was creating the music for these tours they were um, they, they took place on these little golf cart buggies which a lot of the the tourist tours happen on in Krakow. Um, so people go around on these little golf carts and uh, through speakers, they hear a pre-recorded tour as they're going around. Um, and so I created the music and sound design for, for those tours. We also did one in, so we did the first one in Kazimierz and then there was another one in Podgorzia, which Ola was very much involved in. Um, and then more recently, another project I've worked on with Festivals is um, an augmented reality site-specific dance performance 
that takes place in the former ghetto area, the Jewish ghetto here in Krakow. And that was kind of a bigger project that unfolded over a longer period of time. Um, initially as a live performance, and then it had a second life as, a, as an augmented reality app so that anybody can take this or, or do this experience, have this experience at any time uh, through downloading the app and layering what they see in front of them as they're guided around the ghetto area with the aspects of performance, which were dance, music, sound design, uh, text, poetry, um, and spoken word. And I think I'll leave it there for now, but happy to, to go into more detail. And I'll, I'll drop some links in the chat to videos where you can, you can see these, uh, more about these projects. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the for these like this round of introductions into your project uh, projects. And now I would like to uh, go straight into uh, some reflections that you have um, from working on these projects, because as we all know, like the the experience of the global COVID pandemic somehow like uh, caused that we were all like immersed in the technologies uh, in some sometimes to the extent that was uh, too much for us or like too much to handle or too difficult to handle but on the other hand uh, this was also like uh, for many organizations and institutions a moment where when they decided they they are taking a crash course into digital transformation and they're trying to benefit from these opportunities of like everybody being suddenly um, spending so much time online and there's definitely no coming back but I guess there's also like a huge need for discussing the the potential of digital technologies and the obstacles or like the challenges related with um, with going digital and I will come would like to come back to you Peter and ask you about that because obviously you are creating an educational tool that is like from what I understood uh, also like uh, addressed to teachers and educators uh, and the youth itself correct me if I'm wrong so tell us a little bit about like why going digital and what was like what was the thing that was tempting you all to do so and what were the obstacles or like the challenges that you faced well, as I said, like we started like very um, um, much before uh, anybody would expect a pandemic to come. Um, and we thought that there is so much bad content online that we would like to face it online as well, not just in the classroom. And we already know that um, uh, there is a lot of educators, um, let's talk about teachers uh, in formal education, uh, who avoid these topics because they are too sensitive and controversial, uh, which is not um, then uh, like young people then do not have like uh, many opportunities for other inputs to face it and to somehow tackle it. Um, so that's how we decided to do that. Actually, when the pandemic came, um, we thought like, yeah, this is the time, you know, like we have the tool ready and uh, now it's gonna be used and it was used and it is extensively used. At the same time, one of the things which was pointed out in the uh, keynote speech in the beginning was that uh, first and foremost, uh, learning and um, social media and our media are human. It's not about technology, technology is only the means, uh, but it's about human interaction. And uh, uh, while the, it was handy to have the, the tool ready and it was used, now that uh, in many countries, including Slovakia, where I'm now sitting, uh, schools are open, the last thing they want to do is to do online thing, right? Because they are finally uh, in schools and uh, they would like to have uh, printed materials which they can use. And uh, while Five years ago, we were be suggesting like, yeah, you can print it out, but um, it would be nice like, you know, if you try out like to do it online because it can be more attractive, appealing uh, for, for your students. Now we are uh, quite relaxed about this uh, and we say, yeah, do whatever you want. Yeah, just use the video from the website without registering, without creating virtual classes. 
um, uh, if it fulfills your purpose, uh, what you want to uh, achieve with the class, uh, then go for it. And maybe one last thing that I want to say is that uh, reluctance uh, to deal with these issues, be it offline or online, uh, can be caused not only because of the uh, sensitivity of the issues uh, or unreadiness to use digital tools, but also that uh, relevance to the curriculum might not be so um, clear. So what we see as one of the tasks we want to do uh, in the near future is like actually like to show that, yeah, there's like this standard curriculum that you are obliged uh, to follow as a teacher, as a school. Uh, and this tool contributes to achieving some of the goals or developing some of the competencies. And I think that that's one of the lessons also like for basically for any educational tools that are developed outside the system. Um, that uh, you need somehow like to prove that whatever you offer is actually doing the job that the teachers are supposed to do anyway. I, I have a follow-up question, a question or two to that. First of all, so did you, when, when you were starting the, um, the tool, like starting working on the tool, did you have already the curricula in the back of your head or was that something that became relevant later? So was the tool created with the need to fit into different curricula? No, not really. So that was, that, that became relevant later. Very good question, but like, I think that that, that made us free uh, in a way because like it was seven countries um, and some of them like Germany, Austria have different education systems in different uh, parts of, of the country. Um, so like if we spend time on doing this, the same as we spend time on theories and concepts, that I think that we wouldn't be ready until now. Uh, so we decided like to jump in the water and uh, talk to young people, uh, how they perceive, you know, their life and uh, whatever is happening around them, uh, their identity uh, and stuff. And only then we kind of like put it together, uh, uh, adopted some pedagogical approaches, which are not trivial actually, like we are using the, um, Harvard uh, School of Education uh, methodology uh, on visible thinking, which is regardless of the content, uh, and that's connection to the curricul curriculum question, regardless of the content and the country specific, whatever you want to achieve, uh, visible thinking uh, method and exercises teaches you uh, to to develop a view on your own learning. So it's kind of like a meta level. It's like reflecting on how I learn, what I do when I do this, when I make a um, uh, generalization or when I make a metaphor. Um, so whatever content you get, um, you are as an experienced learner going through this process, um, you are reflecting on the way you, you learn. And this, very much connects like to the, the basic concept that um, uh, Victoria mentioned in the beginning. It, definitely it's about interaction, communication, participation, but it's about ownership of your own learning. And this way it's also about empowering. And uh, well, since we are dealing with ethical, with uh, sensitive issues, uh, ethical considerations are very much in place. So for example, like with collecting the stories, like we, really did not want to say like, oh, so yeah, you are the Muslim girl from Germany. So uh, now tell us about your experience so that you can represent the, you know, experiences of German girls from Germany, uh, Muslim girls, girls from Germany. No, not at all. It's just her and her experience and she's not representative of anybody else. Um, and um, this is only one of the ethical issues which was there. The other was like, if somebody, um, we had this example um, experience in Slovakia. We really want to have uh, Roma represented in the tool, and there are some. We want more, um, but you cannot just like uh, put, put a person in the chair and say, "Okay, so now you are Roma and tell us." No, like if the person is not identifying as Roma for many different reasons, then we are definitely not the ones like who should you know 
force the person to tell the story so that we can uh, put it in the learning tool. Um, yeah, I, I think I when yeah yeah no no actually I had uh, another follow up question so let me just like because there's one more thing that um, you said about the fact that you observe that teachers might be reluctant to actually use the tool in the digital form like they might want to print materials because after the lockdowns people are eager to hang out and just spend time together and focus on, on like for example group work or discussion not necessarily creating online classrooms or whatever so is that something that you already observe is that the tendency that you observe or is that just your intuition that you decided to be more relaxed about like the ways in which people are using the tool I think it can be complementary and really like uh, we should give, I mean, when I came to the foundation, which is like very much focusing on human rights education and intercultural education, uh, some of the predecessors were saying that you either provide the fish or teach people to fish, you know, like give them tools to do it. And they said that it's about also about teachers. Many of them like uh, would be very happy, like if there is like the uh, nicely packed product, uh, finite, you know, like just like given to them. Um, but I think that there should be like some kind of uh, freedom in what they should do. They can have inspiration, they can have inputs. Uh, and the same goes with either online or offline using of whatever is offered to them. So uh, if they are reluctant because they like digital skills, if they are um, prepared or ready, yeah, let's train them with digital skills. If they are relaxing because of uh, sensitive issues, then yeah, let's train them. Let's give them like some, some inputs or insights, how to deal with it, how to create safe space. Because with those issues like you, on one hand, you want um, uh, students or learn learners to be open. At the same time, you want them to be respectful. Uh, and sometimes like these two things clash uh, because uh, many times when you are very open, you can hurt people for sure. Um, and teachers are reluctant to do that. Uh, more so if it's not under control, meaning that it's happening virtually in a virtual classroom. So I think it's a process and in different countries that are involved in our project, um, uh, there are many different realities um, and nuances that needs, need to be tackled. So yeah, I, I think that this kind of like relaxed approach, like use whatever is meaningful to you um, is, um, is the way now. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I will now move to Carolina because uh, your project is very different, has a very different background. So what were the, First of all, why did you decide to go digital? So why a digital reconstruction, not a physical reconstruction that is standing, for example, in a museum somewhere? And secondly, were there challenges or considerations that you faced while working on the project when it comes to using technology or like going digital with the project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, starting... Um, um what, what was the challenges maybe uh, about this this digital reconstruction uh first of all i have to um say it, it is a um, scientific project so it was uh, elaborated at uh, uh, the architecture institute in uh, mainz uh, in germany and uh, the group of the people that were involved in this were uh, students and uh, scholars. So, so the first aim of the project was to create a virtual research environment uh, to digitally reconstruct an object and to create a kind of pattern that can be used for other digital reconstruction. We also uh, have it in mind that maybe in the future uh, there will be uh, other people uh, wanting to reconstruct um, the synagogues in, in other spaces. In the meantime, also, uh, we, we had this question to maybe um, create a, a project of a digital reconstruction for Silesia, for the synagogues in small cities. Uh, 
So, um, so, so the first aim was, was to uh, create a kind of uh, frame. Uh, so, so this website uh, with uh, all the system, how to describe the sources, how to uh, make a footnotes uh, to, the, to the digital reconstruction that somebody who really wants to discover um, what, uh, what, how, how we did it, uh, which, which part of the synagogue it's documented in a specific source. Uh, all, all those informations were included and to, to develop the system, we uh, have to put a lot of effort to, to, uh, to make it clear to, to the user. Uh, but it is also a big challenge and I, I felt it from the very beginning that it's, it's very complicated and if somebody just opened this website, uh, it, it can be not so easy to, to follow, to, to understand how does it work. And uh, um, we also try to um, create uh, something that would be easier, easy to access. So on the website, you can find a movie uh, and movie, it's, it's quite um, catching. It's really appealing to people. Uh, it's uh, showing uh, the reconstruction, so we can uh, just see it from the outside, from the inside. So it's it's like a final effect, and you can really feel how this building uh, looked like. Um, and another part of this project was also uh, augmented reality app as well. Uh, it was uh, connected with a postcard. I, I have this this postcard with me. And uh, here you have a ground uh, floor of, of the synagogue. And if you download the app and put the camera on this, uh, on this site, uh, the um, synagogue will be visible um, on your screen. And uh, this card was uh, given to the uh, people uh, that were Mm, who are uh, participating uh, in the March of a Mutual Respect. It's a very important event in Wrocław. Uh, it's already, I don't know which one editions, over 25 years of, of tradition that uh, people are getting together uh, in front of the, um, of the existing synagogue and they march together to the place where the this uh, bigger new synagogue uh, used to uh, stand. So, so we gave this cards to the people uh, and we, um, we, we just uh, present this project. So it was also part to um, get out of this uh, like scholar bubble and go to the people and tell them, okay, we are creating uh, something special, some, some, some kind of uh, reconstruction that you can see with your mobile phone or um, see on your uh, PC. So um, it was important for me just to uh, create also this, uh, this link to the, uh, let's say, young people, um, people um, that tourists uh, and people that lives in Wrocław that they really can access uh, this, uh, this, this uh, end effect we, we created. Because for me, it, it was also kind of the project that there are many wonderful ideas, big uh, international uh, project that are somewhere in the virtual uh, world and nobody knows about it because uh, it's uh, only like some, some circles of, of uh, scholars or um, some, some people that are really um, eager to, to find some information will came across to, to this project. And um, uh, another challenge was that uh, there is uh, a small monument uh, close to the place where the synagogue used to um, stay. So, um, I think that it would be nice to, to have a kind of, let's say like QR code or maybe this app there that people that will search for the, uh, this, um, this place where, where the memory 
has this material uh, part uh, can also access this, this virtual uh, reconstruction. Uh, and um, in the meantime, there was also a, a, a archaeological excavation of what's uh, it's hidden in the ground. And this is uh, very interesting because uh, the, the this fundaments are just um, perfectly um, they, they they remained uh, so it's possible to discover them it's possible to uh, show also this um, um, this um, material part of of the synagogue uh, and um, this this is another problem that um, it it was a big discussion what to do with this uh, with this place. Uh, if uh, it uh, should be discovered, like if we should see this material part of, or it will be because there was also some kind of plan to build a hotel uh, on at this uh, uh, plot. So so it was a big discussion in Breslau in Brotsov uh, two years uh, ago, I guess, and it's still open. And uh, it was uh, for me um, very uh, sad that somebody um, also um, used the argument that if we have this uh, digital virtual reconstruction, then we don't need to uh, discover this material part or rebuild the building because the digital reconstruction already exists. So, uh, so this is also kind of, the um, interesting and maybe um, controversial argument that if we create something digital, then uh, if the, the, the material place, it's not so important. I, I do not agree with it. I would like to have both. I'm not maybe um, convinced that we have to rebuild this building. Uh, but if there are some material parts, I think they really should be uh, exposed uh, and um, be part of, of the um, public space. So thank it's you. Fascinating. Yeah, this is fascinating what you said that actually it was like an unexpected side effect of your project that somebody took it, took it as an argument to like maybe build up the like, or like just basically build something on top of the the site just because there is a digital reconstruction somewhere. Um, but I also wanted to ask you a follow up question because like if I understand correctly, um, this was like uh, in the first place an academic project. Then and, and the digital was there basically as a as a dissemination tool, let's say, or like as a, as a way of reaching out to audiences. Is that right? Is that how you conceptualized it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, yeah, the thing is that uh, we can't uh, rebuild all the non-existing object and uh, it's also kind of controversial uh, if it's a good uh, way to, to rebuild uh, all the synagogues that were destroyed uh, during the um, November um, pogrom. So, um, so yeah, this, of course, uh, it's not so easy, even if we decide we want to reconstruct a building, it's a, a huge amount of money. Uh, it's a question, what's the purpose of it? Uh, do we have uh, a Jewish community that will take care of this object or we are just building a um, empty uh, shell? Um, so, um, I, I guess uh, the answer can be different for uh, each city, uh, depending on the local um, circumstances. But uh, as I said, in case of Wrocław, um, I guess it's not possible for the moment to rebuild uh, the synagogue. It was really uh, big, uh, very uh, complicated building. And we have uh, another synagogue, uh, uh, smaller, which uh, is very good for the Jewish community. Mm, the Jewish community right now, it's not so big as it was before the war. Uh, so uh, probably um, it uh, wouldn't be a question to, to rebuild the synagogue. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so this digital reconstruction was uh, 
a way to uh, to show the complicated story behind the building also um, because this is a kind of tool that uh, also enable young people to to know more about the history of the building about the um, people that were involved in creation of this building about the architect itself uh, so so I guess it's uh, kind of the tool more interesting than a book <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's controversial I know but uh, yeah it's it's somehow it links you to the to the other information you can just uh, see um, other um, pictures and, and sources so so it's also attractive in a way and it also somehow like as uh, as i was scrolling through the website it also like shares the research process right so it's like mm -hmm. it's also like shares your process and the materials that were used in the process which i think is also like very much about connecting the past and the present so that mm -hmm. it's not only about the past and the building that was once there but also about like how we today can discover something which i think is also like an interesting side of the project and this also somehow links me to uh, to the festivals project and now i will turn also to alex because i think making the invisible visible is something that is very much the core issue in the projects so i was i also want, wanted to ask you like how do you think like the digital shaped the these two projects that you were talking about and where they're obstacles or challenges that you think these technologies brought to to the table hmm. um, for me one of the biggest challenges with new technologies is the new technology it sounds like a, a simple thing to say but um, with things like augmented reality it's emerging still so there aren't really templates for the kind of work that we're doing and everybody involved in a project like this is pretty much doing it for the first time uh, we worked with a development company that um, specialize in augmented reality but they'd never done anything with um, dance for example um, and so the complexity of the project was about bringing people together from many different backgrounds to try and make this thing work but there's yeah there's plenty of obstacles we we came up against along the way mainly technical things like you know we um had an idea for what might be possible but then the developer would come back and say actually uh no it's not or what about doing this instead and so it just takes a kind of openness to allow that dialogue to unfold um which in a sense is the same with any project of that kind, whether there's new technology involved or not. But in that case, there's slightly more focus on the technical aspects of it. Um, maybe it's simpler to stick with the augmented reality app for a second uh, when talking about um, this question of why, why make it digital in, in the first place. Um, in that particular case, it made a lot of sense both um, on a conceptual level and also because of the sites that we were working at. Um, and I think when we're when we're working with sites that have difficult or culturally sensitive histories, which I know you do a lot of Ola, with, with the foundation. Um, it's it's a really good way of kind of layering an experience on top of a place without altering its physical nature um essentially that's what augmented reality is it, it takes what you're seeing in front of you and it layers things on top of it to create a kind of hybrid experience um and so when we're walking around the krakow ghetto and there are places where buildings used to exist that don't anymore. Uh, like for example, there's a, there was a Jewish orphanage, which is one of the sites on the, uh, on the experience, which doesn't exist now. And there's just this empty space between other buildings. Um, and th this space itself kind of has this 
aura. It has this vibe there, which is difficult to, to describe. But that's part of the reason for, for this kind of approach is to, to layer things on top of what you can see in front of you. Which, you know, there might be things missing, like there's a building that's not there, but you can, you can attempt to, as you said, make the invisible visible in that way. So it makes sense in that capacity. And also um, conceptually, it was kind of a way of um, almost creating ghost-like figures. Because when you see a dancer in augmented reality, you're, you're looking at them through your phone and you're moving your phone camera around. So you're seeing what's in front of you, but then you're also seeing these digitally recreated figures. They have this very ghostly character to them. They're, they're not, it's not quite like you're just seeing a video of someone. Uh, it's a little bit more ephemeral. And so with a project like this that deals with history and things that don't exist anymore, whole groups of people that don't exist anymore, and the actual places where atrocities took place, um, it was very powerful to us to, uh, to find a way to make that visible and, and palpable in some sense. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on something Carolina said. It's going off a little bit on a tangent, but um, I was very interested in this idea of the question of the, the digital making the physical redundant. And as Carolina was saying, the, the, the idea to create a digital reconstruction, people were, asked, were saying, well, why do we need to do the physical one before we've got the digital one? It made me think of a um, completely unrelated project that's nothing to do with me, but um, that's really bringing that question to the foreground, which is a project uh, by the British artist Damien Hirst. He's a very famous sort of modern artist, conceptual artist. And he's doing a project at the moment, which is um, it's using NFT technology, so blockchain technology, another emerging technology. Basically, in a nutshell, what he's done is he's made 10,000 physical paintings so there are physical objects that exist. And then he's made uh, an NFT, which is like a digital token for each one of those paintings. And he's selling the digital tokens, the NFTs in auctions through like Sotheby's in London. Um, so very famous auction houses. And uh, what's happening is at the end of a year, which will take us through to July next year, uh, whoever buys the NFTs has the option to exchange them for the physical painting. So you can say, I want to exchange my NFT for the physical painting. The digital version gets destroyed and you get sent the physical one in the post. So there's this question of, do I hold on to the digital version, uh, which has a certain value? And you know, you get a high res kind of download of it, of the actual painting, or do I exchange it? for the physical version, what, what is more valuable? However you ascribe value, whether it's monetary value, emotional value, sentimental value, artistic value, um, technological value, because obviously this is a kind of experiment. It really brings that question to the fore. It's like, that's what the project is asking essentially. And it's putting, it's putting the, the power to answer the question in the hands of the audience, which I think is, is quite an interesting way of of doing it it's kind of saying well what do you what do you want to do we're going to find out at the end of a year whether people value the digital or the physical more highly um so it's kind of an interesting experiment that that i thought of when when caroline was talking about this dynamic between the digital and, and physical and that that challenge yeah it also like comes up in this in this um discussion a lot because the that the tension between the physical and digital and whether we and which one we prefer is like something that better also brought up but i wanted to also like pick up on that and ask you uh in the context of your of the memory score project alex because like usually we experience dance and performance in groups right because this is an event so usually even if it's a site specific uh piece done in public space we usually experience that as a group experience right because the, it happens like at the given moment so we have to gather somewhere to experience that and with the memory score project with the digital with the app you actually 
created a possibility for people to experience that piece individually. And was that something that was like pers purposefully done or, or was it something that like came up accidentally that it's like a completely different experience? Yeah, it was definitely a deliberate thing. And we were very much thinking how powerful it could be for everybody to have a very unique and individual experience. Um, it created problems as well, because obviously when, when we did the live version of the performance, people are in a group and they're essentially getting guided through the sites uh, by the performers. And with the, with the app, um, it's very easy for people to get lost, even though there's a kind of, there's a map and a kind of navigator tool within the app. When we've gone around and done kind of um, test runs of it, uh, people do get lost. So it, it, it throws up, you know, logistical questions like that. But um, we were definitely thinking of how, uh, how different the experience is when, when you're doing it on your own. Um, and we, we, that's one reason why we built into the experience some time for kind of solitary contemplation. There's a moment, for example, where you're guided to a bench and the music stops for a couple of minutes and you're just invited to contemplate or meditate on what you've experienced so far. And then the voice in your headphones picks up again and, and you're kind of guided to the next space. So even on the, on the group version, on the live version, we were trying to build that in. And that's something that's actually easier on an individual level because you can essentially give them, give the individuals the power to hit the continue button whenever they're ready. Uh, whereas in a group, obviously, somebody has to decide, now we're all gonna move to this next place. So there are some things that were more challenging about that and some things that actually made a lot more sense. Thanks a lot. And I actually, it brings me again to something that Victoria has mentioned in her keynote um, earlier, that like there's, there is a lot of like things around giving up control over things that are digital or like over experience that you hand over to people that they can like curate for themselves, right? Like this is, you're, you're not controlling that. And I wanted to come back to Peter because this also is something that you mentioned. And I think this control, you've mentioned the, the control in the virtual class, classroom being different than the control that you have like in the physical experience. And also like, I wonder whether you had concerns with like recording these stories of the actual contemporary young people and putting up, putting them up online, whether you, we had considerations whether they will be confronted with some whatever aggressive comments or negative experiences as soon as you know you 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 somehow like lose control on the com of the content as soon as it gets online and it gets shared. Mm, well, as I said, like when you have the virtual class before, like going into sensitive topics, like it's really not helpful, but kind of necessary, like to create safe space, because let's say that in the classroom, you have somebody who um, uh, considers himself, herself to be part of some uh, group. And the story which is portrayed is about that group. Then, you know, you really need to think through like what this will cause to the person. Let's say that you have, um, um, I don't know, uh, a, a Roma uh, guy in, in the classroom and you show the Roma story, then uh, what kind of discussion th this can trigger? That's one part. So that's for the educators where I fully understand their um, not necessarily reluctance with some yes, but uh, um, like like being very cautious, you know, like about if if to do this or not. And then with making the stories, like we really made sure that people only say what they want to say. Um, even now when we want to do the follow-up and because we, we want to increase diversity of voices, uh, we feel that some of them are underrepresented in the tool. Um, um, like now in here uh, in Milan Žimečka Foundation in Slovakia, we don't have funds like to do the event and actually like there are no conditions to do the event. But before it proved to be um, 
very good like actually like to invite people for the event with other people uh, young people i mean like from 14 to 19 of course with uh, parental consent um where we just like did activities together and they uh, expressed whatever they wanted about their experience about their identity etc and we were basically picking uh what they said already meaning that in the group they were comfortable to share something and then we asked them is it okay like if we record your experience in some way and the same thing happened in the international event in berlin in 2014 i think um where there was a bunch of international um young people and again it was more about sharing in the group and if somebody felt comfortable and was asked by the crew by the team is it okay like if we actually record your experience um and then they yeah some of them say said yes some some no um we recorded it of course they saw it because nowadays like it's important to see yourself so that you give consent to uh go online um and yes for out of i think around 50 stories which are now online there are two which were taken down uh because of the request of the uh of the person talking uh for reasons we do not explore in like deeper but like uh, there is one story where the protagonist said uh my life changed i do not want to be visible like this and we said yeah definitely okay so um it is sensitive you really need to take care of of this stuff but like all content and personal views um, or stories which are shared are uh, with full consent of those people and and this is clear for them that they can always like withdraw their consent and then these stories are are taken down yes for sure and actually there is one thing that i would like to connect to alex and carolina that were saying um uh i don't know three weeks ago there was pope francis in slovakia big thing right um one of the first uh events he attended on his request was to go to the site of the former jewish synagogue which is not there anymore interestingly not torn down by the nazis but by the communists because of building the bridge um and that was a very nice connection of um being physical on the space which is not existing anymore there is only only like a, a kind of painting on the on, on on the bridge and then you see like this um uh silhouette of the former synagogue and the pope and uh, uh representative of the jewish community and the audience was yeah survivors descendants and these kind of people um and so there was like this visual input, there was this symbolic material input, and there were people. And that's how I found the connection can be really strong with this combination. I don't know if, if I make sense, but like, uh, it's like, if there was virtual uh, a Pope talking on the screen, it definitely wouldn't be the same as he was on the site of the former Jewish synagogue just, just next to the Bratislava Cathedral, um, talking about, you know, like, let's bond together because of the things, bad things with, that happened before. And I saw it televised, so as I, I was digital, um, uh, but still, like, it was very strong, uh, but I can emphasize the connection of the digital and physical. Thanks for that comment because I think it brings all the projects somehow together. Also, in a in a sense that all the projects are somehow focused on the contemporary experience, right? On the on on the contemporary stories related to the stories of the past, right? Because these are not only projects about things that happened, but these are also projects about like things that happened and what we are doing with these things now, right? And I think this is like in very different ways, very present in all of the stories. And uh, following up on what you said, Peter, I wanted to ask Carolina and Alex, and if, if hopefully at least one of you want to answer this, this question, is 
whether you feel that as a threat, like that, like digitally commemorating things, or like if we think of these projects as forms of digital commemorations, uh, the synagogue projects or the memory score in the case of the ghetto, Krakow ghetto, do you think that this somehow like um, creates the threat that the physical uh, places might not be commemorated or like receive significant attention as in your example, Carolina, because of the fact that, oh, there is this digital narrative already there. So we this is taken care for. Or do you think this can actually like wake the way, uh, work the other way around and actually facilitate some changes in the physical space? I'm not sure if each or like any of you would like to answer this question. Do you want to go first, Carolina? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I can I can go first. Um, yeah, as, as I said uh, in the beginning, I was not conscious that it can be a threat uh, for the real uh, like commemoration in the reality. Um, first, I have to say, say that uh, there there was this uh, small monument uh, built in the nineties. So after the transformation in, in Poland, um, the Jewish community uh, together with, with the city um, decided to um, commemorate the place where the synagogue uh, used to be. Mm, but um, it, was, um, it, it was just a, a small monument and in the meantime, uh, as we were creating this digital reconstruction, uh, there was another uh, fact that we have this fundaments in, in the ground. Uh, so there is a potential to, to, to show something uh, real, like a real parts of, of the object. Uh, and nobody was uh, thinking about it before that maybe there is some something in the ground maybe we can do this excavation maybe we can uh, just uh, um, have this link to the past to the material past so so yes as as we started we didn't know it and uh, in the meantime we just discovered that yeah it can be an argument that uh Mm, this this material parts it's um, not so important anymore because because there is a digital reconstruction which also gives a kind of um, let's say uh, impression of the building which is of course uh, for some much more um, appealing much more um, complete than just a uh, part uh, of the bricks or stones that are in the uh, in the in this area. Mm, so um, yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, it, it might be used in, in that way that uh, uh, in, in cases we don't have much uh, at the side, the building it's totally destroyed and there are only some parts. For, for some people it can be an argument that, uh, well, there is uh, space, uh, empty space in the city. Um, it was like eight or over eight years ago. Let's go uh, further. Let's look to the future. Uh, why we should uh, rebuild the uh, synagogue of the German Jews in the Polish city? This is also a question because lots of have this complicated uh, story that uh, uh, after the uh, borders were shifted after the Second World War, um, there was a complete exchange of, uh, of the um, people and also like right now Jewish community is Polish Jewish community, not German. So, so uh, it may be used as an argument, but I have this uh, strong feeling that we, we really have to um, see it as a, our common European heritage. So we can't just uh, think of, uh, of, of this uh, material part as of the story from the past that do not matters because uh, it's, um, it's, it's just 
part of the non-existing building, non-existing uh, that belongs to non-existing German Jewish community in the mid of the 19th century or beginning of the 20th century. No, it's it's a part of our heritage, and we have to um, tell the, the the story and. Uh, also make people um, be uh, sensitive to to this to, to what happened uh, using of course digital tools because they are very um, mm, appealing to young people as well I, I, I saw it as uh, we we uh, were giving the card and uh, young people were just uh, looking through their smartphones to this to this digital reconstruction it was really uh, working, uh, especially for, for young people. So it was like a first step to um, to catch some interest, to, to be in, interested in the history of, of this space. And maybe if, if they see it, um, I don't know, on the, uh, on the plate uh, or somewhere in the book, it won't be that catching. So, so of course, the new technology uh, can help to um to to disseminate the knowledge but also material part because we we are material we are living in the material world so i i can't um, uh, think of not um having this respect for the material parts in the city uh of course it can be combined with um, something new uh, we, we have many good examples uh, so it's, I guess, possible to build a new building close to the um, place uh, of, of commemoration and to um, combine those two. So, so I'm, I'm open to it, but uh, not to totally uh, just forget about uh, material past. Thanks. Thanks. Alex, would you like to uh, go next? Yeah, um, I think my first thought is even before COVID, we're all moving towards a world where the, the lines between digital and physical are becoming more and more blurred. Um, and that's been taking place, you know, for at least a decade or, or more um, in the sense that people are essentially interacting with their environment through technology now more than ever, uh, which is obvious when you see people walking around on their smartphones, almost completely oblivious of what's happening IRL in front of them. Um, of course, the pandemic has expedited that process so that we've all um, very quickly gotten used to that blurring. Um, for me, there's, there's always a question of why use a particular medium um, particularly in, in the artistic realm where we, we question everything. We, we think, why, why do this? Why do that? What's the justification for one particular medium over another? Um, which I imagine is the same in, in all of our different disciplines. We have to first think about the overall goal for the project and then think about the means that we're going to use to reach that goal. And sometimes um, more of a material physical focus is going to work better than a digital focus sometimes the other way around um, i'm thinking about another situation here in krakow that's that's maybe relevant to this conversation which is uh Pwashuf, the, the former concentration camp in the south part of the city where for many years there's been a conversation about should we have a museum built here? At, at the moment, there's, there's very little physical commemoration of what happened there. Um, there's a few signs up, but it's, it's a difficult space because it's, uh, it's essentially a, a burial ground now. There are unmarked graves, which by Jewish law should not be disturbed. And so building something there is, is tricky, building something physical that is, but also, Right now, it's it's basically a, a green space. It's a park, and so residents don't want the park um, changed or, or destroyed, as, as they would see it, which is understandable. So, 
I'm thinking in situations like that, the use of digital means can be a really useful problem solver. Uh, and in fact, I have brought up a few times in conversations with people who are involved in that conversation here in the city, the possibility of doing something similar to what we did with memory score. So creating an app that is essentially a, a digital museum that doesn't involve building a physical space on a site where that would be very tricky. Uh, and yet can be educational, informative, can facilitate artistic projects, can also allow um, for a lot more fluidity than if you were to build a brick and mortar museum that needs physical curation and artifacts and so on. Um, so I'm thinking in situations like that, those kinds of tools can really come into their own. Yeah, I think like it's interesting that you brought up this uh, this example because I think this is really true that in some places where there is a conflict around what to do with the site, right? The the non physical solutions might actually be the solutions that that can save the situation or that can actually solve the problem, which I think is is something that we rarely think about because we mostly think about like either the digital or the physical. And like, I think, and also in what Peter said, I think it said it was present that sometimes the combination of the digital and the physical. So like the physical site and then the extension that gives you some additional knowledge might be something that actually is the type of experience that we would like to design for, for the people uh, in the particular site. And I'm just, I've just posted in the chat, uh, a question about the questions or comments, the comments if there are there some, are because some. we will shortly be finishing and closing our discussion. So I see there is a there is a raised hand. Yeah, Victoria, come on and join us. And if you want, yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's been really interesting. It's it's late, but it's <laughs> it's really stimulating and interesting conversation. Um, I had a question for Carolina actually, and. Um, the, the, the 3D reconstruction is, is a really fascinating, important project in itself, but one of the things that struck me with your project is, this, is the archive and the possibilities of that archive. Um, and that while, in a way, if you were talking about the animation being a kind of output from an academic project, but it feels like there's so much potential in the archive. And you know, going back to what Alex was just talking about there, about um, you know, not necessarily creating museums and, and Kelly, you were saying you're not necessarily having to rebuild the synagogue. But I wondered if you thought more about different ways of kind of performing that archive in the future as a kind of legacy of this project in any way. Um, yeah, th thank you for, for this question. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I started um, my introduction with saying that I was uh, writing my master thesis on, on this building. So uh, it's for me kind of long uh, history of, of uh, learning about this building. Um, there are different uh, groups of sources in, in Wrocław, in Hanover, in Berlin. So, um, be, because it's, it's a very complicated uh, story, there are many, many uh, information all over the world, in fact. Also pictures, uh, the pictures of the burning synagogue are very rare. So, so this is really a big potential of, of the sources. Uh, to the history of the building. Mm, and uh, in fact, what we wanted to do, it's just to um, collect them all, to describe it. Uh, so to uh, some, somehow prepare this uh, material to be, to be seen for the other scholars to, to learn from it or all the people that are interested. Uh, and um, of course, we, we need it for the reconstruction. Um, so I, I personally do not have any idea what would we could do with it uh, more, but uh, I, I see this, this potential. And uh, uh, also the reconstruction itself uh, gives uh, a big uh, potential because we already uh, had also a question 
if somebody could use the, the digital reconstruction to uh, create a kind of uh, a digital space for a concert for the living orchestra or that, that will be playing inside the synagogue. So, um, so uh, after the project ended, uh, it's already it was two years ago, uh, I see that it's still um, kind of uh, like a story that develops and there are many uh, ideas what you can do with, with this material, with the, um, with the app itself or, uh, or with the reconstruction. So I hope uh, and of course uh, we as I'm saying right now in the um, as a Hochschule Mainz uh, Architecture Institute, uh, let's say, member. So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, the institute is open if somebody would like to do something, uh, kind of artistic uh, performance or project or use part of this reconstruction. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm quite sure that it's possible. Mm, but the project was um, ended, so right now we are just uh, not working anymore on it. So, so, so no, there are no ideas now what to do with it more. I hope that answers your question, Victoria. And actually, I think it brings us to to an interesting, like, um, final remarks because I I do think that somehow what the digital brings to the project that you were that we were discussing and and that you were describing is the fact that this like uh, handing over control to people as potential designer of designers of their experience either uh, whether they are teachers like in the in Peter's examples or educators that can like have freedom with working with these materials in the way they want or whether it's that with the memory score where people can curate their own experiences or in the case of Carolina's project, maybe something will be built up around this uh, this project as a concert, as for example, a concert in the digital synagogue. I think this is the, the interesting part that like comes with the digital because like by putting it out there and handing over control, we somehow like invite different uses. Whether these uses happen or not, this is another question for another discussion, how we should stimulate the these like reuses and uses of the things that we put out there. But I think this opens up an interesting uh, possibility for like, people playing with what we've created and actually adding additional layers to it, which I would love to see as a, as a result of such digital projects. Um, so that would be my like, um, my wish for all the projects that you were discussing so that they are like, so that they, they are built over with some interesting reuses or like different ways of like using them in different situations, both online and offline. And I would love to close with that, but I also like would like to check with you whether you have some final remarks that you'd like to share before we say goodbye to our audience and all of us. I would Alex. just like to add um, that I actually run a virtual space in a in a metaverse or a, a virtual world called Crypto Voxels, and. Um, I'm going to put a link to it in the chat and if anybody either among the panel or who's listening has any ideas for projects that they would like to put on in a virtual space uh feel free to reach out and um and let's chat it's it's basically a yeah it's, it's a virtual space at the moment we're using it to exhibit artwork like digital artwork um but it, it can be anything you you enter it as a kind of avatar and you can walk around it and look at things on the wall and click on things. And I'll put a link to it in the chat. Um, but I think it's very much relevant to this discussion of what you can do in virtual spaces uh, and, and in different contexts. So feel free to reach out if anybody's interested. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm checking if Peter and Carolina would like to add anything before we go. I can. Uh, it's just a very short remark. Um, 
even in this digital tool, when we have uh, live stories, the stories of people who uh, experience persecution, we are using like some kind of uh, artifacts, pictures of artifacts, which are, you know, like material, they are real uh, to kind of like get closer and to, so that they can at least like have some virtual touch on the screen with the thing, be the belt or uh, uniform or uh, a piece of cloth, anything. Uh, at the same time, what really came to my mind uh, after uh, Victoria's question and Carolina's answer was that sometimes, and that's uh, Agnieszka's uh, uh, thing, which she shared today, uh, a simple piece of wood can do miracles. Uh, when she was talking about the these wooden uh, stones, uh, whatever you call it. Um, but I think that it made the miracle because of the participation and interaction of the people who actually made it. And that, that's what she emphasized as well, that uh, it's not just, you know, like erecting a monument or doing something like, like putting something in the place. It's, it's about the uh, activity around and um, involvement and participation of people around which can make an impact. So in my eyes, it's not about rebuilding the synagogues, it's about like making the uh, these material things um, I think we've lost better in this uh, very important moment of the discussion. <laughs> it's a pity. Yeah, it's a pity because yeah, it was uh, very Mm, very important moment and uh, yeah, I but totally like, agree what what uh, I started said. being afraid I started being afraid that that's because it's one past eight and we were supposed to finish <laughs> at eight so maybe you know a timer somewhere there just started ringing and yeah like hopefully Peter will come back in the, in a second to to finish his sentence and uh, I see some people appearing on the screen, so I will check if there are any other comments or questions. And if not, we'll probably be closing. And probably we have to do that without Peter. So there will be the suspense forever. <laughs> um, so uh, anyways. Uh, thank you so very, very much for your um, for this discussion and if, to all of you for being with us throughout the whole afternoon. And as Victoria said, it's late, but it's been a really interesting uh, journey. And uh, thanks for being with us and for your uh, inspiring projects, uh, inspiring thoughts and remarks and comments. And we are looking forward for tomorrow, which sadly, for our English speaking friends will be only in Polish. So the international part of the event is over and tomorrow we will have um, another, um, another round in, in the Polish speaking circles. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Alex, thank you, Karolina, and thank you, Peter, who is no, who is no longer here um, for, the, for this discussion and to all the people who presented their project and to Victoria who uh, kicked off the day with her amazing lecture. Thanks again for accepting our invitation and uh, have well-deserved uh, evening uh, rest. Thank you, guys. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.